What is up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing Block Digest episode 280 to you at block height 701,462 on Monday, September 20th. It's been a little longer than normal. Mm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, it's at the, doing the baby updates. But hey, we crossed the 470,000 block height. How about that? Yup. Th- wow. I think we can uh, safely say, though, that the for the foreseeable future, the schedule might just be a little chaotic. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. You know, we're getting close to this. Uh, you know, baby's going to be here in our world now. I mean, baby's already here. But, you know, one more month and then baby will have been birthed. And so the show might suffer a little. It's going to claw his way out like a little alien and alien. Rah! <laughs> oh, it's Rick. gonna be a beautiful thing. When when it's <laughs> when it's born, you have to make sure to say it is block height, blah blah blah. Yeah, I've got to make sure to tweet out like introduction of new Bitcoin toxic maximalist at block height number. <laughs> no, I'm I'm excited, and uh, you know we'll still get the shows out. It'll just be a little bit more intermittent. So, Fud, what what beer are you drinking today? I'm uh, having a little Oktoberfest breakfast. Yeah, so I just I just geared up. Uh, this is a new one on the shelf over where I buy beer. It's called uh, it's called Golden Hammer by Hopworks out of Oregon. It's an organic golden lager. Ooh. Wait a second, what are you talking about? Oktoberfest? It's not October yet. But that's the thing about Oktoberfest. Pre- it starts early. Exactly. Pre-gaming. Excuse me. I, I, as someone from the country who uh, runs this holiday, I disagree. <laughs> well, Americans do what they want, so deal with it. I'm drinking <laughs> Oktoberfest. Yeah, they started th- that thing here now. I think there's some law about it's only Oktoberfest if you're in Germany. Well, I'm breaking the law. Well, it feels like Oktoberfest. This morning I woke up and there was snow up here in the high country. And I'm, all the leaves are changed. It's fall. It's beautiful. So, yeah, crack them, drink them. Wow, snow already. The snow I'm went more, fast. I'm more excited for the pumpkins than I am for the beer, as usual. Oh, I got a little baby pumpkin costume. All oh, right, I'm sorry, baby stuff. That's just because you're a weirdo who doesn't drink beer, Jenny. As far as you know. Ooh, she's been cracking them. Oh, all right. Well, outside of Oktoberfest and the leaves changing and babies, what not have you, uh, what's been going on in Bitcoin? A lot of Chivo stuff, huh? Yeah. Well, you know, like I said last time before, uh, before the official day when things went live, um, the idea that there would be no hiccups or problems was just hopium. Um, and there were plenty yeah. of probably legitimate issues. Um, but one of them is the wallet asking for microphone permission, which why? Like, I, I don't see a rational reason for that, so yeah, that that kind of lends a little more credence to the government down there, maybe getting a little too excited about the we can surveil people with this side of, of the whole platform. Or somebody at, at BitPay, some junior dev is uh, Googling iOS camera microphone access. 
Oh, look, a tutorial. Oh, look, here's how I get camera and microphone access. I need at least one of those. <laughs> that is also a possibility, in which case, like, that's just as cringe as putting someone's real name in a lightning invoice. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it's not that surprising to me. I mean, it shouldn't be there, of course, but it's not surprising to me because, like, don't half of mobile apps just have microphone access even when they don't need it because they just try to get as many permissions as possible? Yeah, not ones I install. Well, yeah, obviously, but we're talking about stuff that most people install, which is random shit in the app store that they haven't checked. Yeah, oh, I, there's, I, this, I, there's this cool little game that I've never heard of before. I'm going to install it. Why does it need access to my microphone? I don't know. I'm yeah, just, that, an, just a normie who wants my $30 in Bitcoin. Yes, you can access my home directory. Yes, you can access my social media. God damn it. Just give me the $30 in Bitcoin already. Yeah, but... Whichever one of these things is the case... <sighs> Any way about it, Bukele was back trolling on Twitter today about buying the dip for a country. Oh, and his bio is yeah. definitely upgraded into kingdom trollness with the dictator in his in his bio. <laughs> Man, yeah. if you have democratic elections, there are just some things you're not supposed to joke about. Dude, despite all my skepticism of everything going on down there, that is hysterical to me. Like, that's exactly something Trump would do. I know, he's, it is a Trumpian move. A anybody remember a certain... You're gonna have to enlighten me. You don't, you don't remember the meme with Trump 20... 24 and then 2028 and then 2032 and then 2036 <laughs> oh yeah where they were just afraid that he was never gonna give up power Ugh. yeah <laughs> once the russians get him in there you know you never you might not be able to get him out but yeah we weird app design choices and um hilarious memes aside there were five days ago um some protests against the bitcoin law and unlike the last few instances of this it looked like a little bit more than like 15 people with tight camera shots um they ended up vandalizing a kiosk or a chivo kiosk and burned down the atm in it um yeah so it's kind of a lot to unpack here um president bukele tweeted out um some pictures and and you should go check his account if you really want to dig deeper he's really been responding to this situation a lot more comprehensively than i'm going to get into but um there was a reporter at a publication down there who was literally walking around like whispering things in people's ear as if he was coordinating something during the, the whole smashing things up there. And this, I cannot verify myself. I do not speak Spanish, but some Spanish pe or speaking people I have sent a copy of the video in the show notes to claim they hear like explicitly in Spanish, somebody going, quick, come over here, look angry, as if they're directing this. And now uh, anybody who listens to this show has heard plenty of my thoughts during the summer of 2020, as far as orchestrating and instigating riots and protests and steering them in certain directions. Um, yeah, that absolutely could have happened. And personally, to me, looking around, probably did in this instance. But that doesn't negate actual skepticism or hesitancy or people who are against this law down there legitimately holding this view. 
just because those types of manipulative strategies can be used to whip up you know a small number of people into violent action and use this to spin media narratives that doesn't just magically invalidate the larger group of people and their feelings and attitudes about things so you know while everybody should fully expect media narrative manipulation along these lines going on down there you shouldn't also rush to just dismiss any actual skepticism of things down there on the basis of manipulative shit like that happening. I think that's well said. In our current era, what prints to video tends to be what what resounds and what CNN can play indignantly. So it, that all seems quite reasonable as far as the take goes. Yeah, it's definitely a good place to start is, uh, you know, taking the side of the fact that there are people who don't understand what this is and don't under don't really care for El Presidente or dictator, you know, and it's just uh, that's going to naturally cause some, yeah, some political strife there where you're going to see protest and people get upset. It is, uh, you know, do have to think about the fact that like, uh, you know, Bitcoin is banking more people than you know, the IMF and central banks have been able to bank for decades there. So it's really showing them to be fooled. Like, you know, it's showing them for what they are. They're, you know, it's a weak link. It's a weak thing. So I can imagine some pushback from them, too, of course. Mm -hmm. But j just like on, on a personal level of how people conduct themselves publicly, like, you know, to kind of round off my, my thoughts here. Um, the Bitcoin Beach Twitter account literally tweeted out a couple days ago, like kind of calling people out on like coming down there to El Zante, to El Salvador, and kind of just being that fucking arrogant foreign dickhead that like thinks they know best about people's lives and situations down there and pretty much like call people out like if you're just going to come down there to lecture people about their country and take advantage of what's going on there just to promote yourself on social media like get the fuck out of here like they said something along the lines of like they're laughing at you behind your back you stupid gringo like you know what i mean and that's something people should be conscious of when looking at this situation like if you're you're not from el salvador then sometimes maybe you should just shut the fuck up and listen and try to learn instead of walking in as a complete fucking stranger with no context no real appreciation of life down there lecturing people in in that situation who live there who do appreciate those things what's best for them because that is just the most asinine type of arrogance. Yep. Well, it looks like the next domino in the uh, countries looking towards Bitcoin is falling. I mean, you know, c dominoes. I mean, but this there's an, there's one in the story story desk now. Ukraine. Yeah. Um, this makes so much sense but just kind of ca like came so far out of left field. Um, and I do think, um, anyone correct me if I'm wrong, that this proposal is actually passed now. But Ukraine wants to, by 2023, phase in Bitcoin like much more gradually than El Salvador did um, and create a dual currency system with their fiat currency, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce um and then potentially past that point um you know maybe just shift completely to bitcoin and they there's been a lot of communications with bukele in terms of like politicians from ukraine talking with him and his future plans to kind of shape their thinking on things and it, it's going to the the point of of even thinking through like Ukraine's energy mix and how Bitcoin could potentially, you know, benefit that in terms of not only the types of like, uh, you know, green carbon sinking for wasted fossil fuels and things like that, but just the general incentive of encouraging new energy development. And like, really, 
uh yeah as much as el salvador is kind of the canary in the coal mine here i think ukraine is going to be like 10 times bigger like they're not just rushing to do it and roll something out like things have kind of played out in el salvador like they're gonna take a few years and probably really systematically study things before implementing anything. And like, that's going to go wildly differently than the kind of fly by night figure shit out approach that El Salvador did. Yep. I really appreciate how they gave themselves some time, you know, a year and a half change. And, uh, this is a foothold in Europe, really. This is a European nation. This is a uh, proxy for Russians. Um, it This is just a great country to be doing this, it seems. And, you know, this country has, has its problems for a while, which may well be one of the reasons that they're interested in it. Um, all the quotes in this article are very forward looking in terms of Bitcoin being a currency that they want to have in the future. And it's uh, it's very clear that they are serious about a dual currency type system and that they're ready to make that happen themselves, regardless of whether they get international help or not. So I'm looking forward to the future cartel of Bitcoin nations that starts to come online here. Right on. It does look it look to be those countries that, you know, Bitcoin really solves the problems that they're running into. And I mean, Ukraine just re recently went through a revolution and it's uh, it's got one of those uh, stories where they're looking to just shore up their governance structure where they don't have to worry about other forces acting out on them and what externalities that brings to their country. So, uh, I mean, I looked at this too, the dual currency thing looks like a great idea and it's smart play. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's going to be good to see. And there goes another domino in a couple of years. Iran's just over a mountain range or two, right? Yeah. And you know, Bitcoin, it makes the unlikely partners. We shall see. But who is up next? I believe it's you, Janine, with some interesting things happening over on this side of the Atlantic. We don't recognize <laughs> your continentalist view of the world. Did, did you pass out, Janine? <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, not selected. <laughs> I'm here. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. so I've been following the Free State Project for a number of years now, and they follow me back on Twitter. Thanks very much. And I'm pleased to report that a state representative there has apparently put forward a proposal to have residents of New Hampshire vote to secede from the United States of America. Mike Sylvia, um, quote, moved to New Hampshire as part of the Free State Project, a movement committed to attracting newcomers to New Hampshire and shrinking the size of the state and local government. The measure does not need the approval of New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu, uh, but it will need to be approved by 60% of the state's House and Senate in order to be put before voters. The state's legislature currently has a Republican majority. The referendum will be considered in January when the next legislative session is underway. If added to the 2020 ballot, it would read, New Hampshire peaceably declares independence from the United States and, and immediately proceeds as a sovereign nation. All other references to the United States in this constitution, state statutes, and regulations are nullified. Um, and the reason um, I cite uh, Tim Cass in particular for this is because when they presented this story on their podcast, which I checked out. Um, they had hundreds of thousands of viewers for the episode, and there was quite a bit of discussion about how New Hampshire are using Bitcoin, which is certainly a possibility given that the annual pork fest um, still occurs there and many people accept it at their stalls, could help to protect this initiative from financial shutdown by the co-opted banking system, which may be used not without precedent to quash political speech like this so it is related what and here i was 
betting on Texas to be the first seed. Well, yeah, that was also, I mean, there was a lot of discussion about this, and they were basically saying, like, New Hampshire may be the first, but there might be a whole bunch of other states who might want to jump on this bandwagon, or at least be supportive to New Hampshire and make it more difficult for the federal government to come in and shut it down, which they probably will do. They will probably, like, they were discussing how they'd want to have control of the highway, because I think Maine... Maine and Vermont might be cut off or something or harder to access. So they will have an issue with that. Um, I mean, they'll have an issue in general with a state trying to leave the country. (laughs) So, um, but yeah, they mentioned Bitcoin as being important um, as a way for them to protect themselves financially from being completely cut off. It's happening. Yeah. I mean, you could, for sure, Texas looked like they were going to be the first to succeed, but New Hampshire's always had that streak in them right now where they just like, you know, live free or die, and they are done with this. So, hey, this starts the discussion for sure. States are about to go off on their own. I, I would totally visit the new sovereign nation of New Hampshire <laughs> if it was <laughs> first Bitcoin porcupine country. It really makes sense. I mean, with all the stuff going on in the news about like the way the federal government has used its powers, I mean, it just makes sense for the states to take back power. I mean, this country was formulated and its constitution was made in a way to defend itself from this type of tyranny. So, yeah, let's start it up, New Hampshire. I hope that some of these areas of these mountains of Colorado will follow suit. You know, I mean, a lot of this territory, you know, it's kind of up for grabs. I mean, like, uh, like every state can kind of be split into a couple of states. Yeah, porcupines and honey badgers are good friends. In democracy, you have to be a player. Try shooting something other than birdshot, you chicken shit! (laughs) Well, it's great to see, and I hope that, you know, the discussion will continue because, for sure, there's supposed to be a separation of powers in this country that helps regulate the concentration of power. And there's been a lot too much a concentration of power under the federal government over the past couple of years and probably over the past couple of decades, to be honest. Like, uh, we all know that. But, man, it seems like not everybody's happy about Bitcoin. Somebody's ready to go to war with Bitcoin. Well, yeah. Um, evidently, the Turkish president, Mr. Uh, Erdogan, was hanging out with some students the other day, and he was asked about uh, whether the central bank was interested in opening uh, cryptocurrency accounts. And uh, Erdogan said, we are in a war against Bitcoin. And uh, I'm sure he said plenty of other stuff, not quoted in this meager article I've got. But I thought that headline was worth just highlighting in terms of general sentiment, because we haven't said as much in this country, but certainly in that country, they've had a war against uh, currency debasement and or general inflation uh, for the past couple of years. So uh, I could see why they might characterize, why he might characterize that as a war against Bitcoin at the end of the day. It got me curious. Uh, There's all these different studies on um, permeation of Bitcoin, on general use of cryptocurrencies uh, in various countries around the world. And I decided I need to actually look it up. And I got to some Statistica survey for owned or used cryptocurrencies in 2020. And they've got Turkey at 16% of uh, people or a share of respondents who indicated that, yes, they did. Uh, What's interesting to me about this list is we got plenty of places around the world uh, that I'm seeing here. Nigeria, Vietnam, Philippines, South Africa, Thailand, Peru, Turkey, Colombia, Argentina, Indonesia, Brazil, where there's greater than 10% penetration of cryptocurrency. You go down there, Saudi Arabia, Switzerland, Chile, like, we are getting a toe in the door here, you know, and uh, it makes sense that a student might pipe up and ask that when surely they have some family 
that have as, escaped some hardship due to that, or there was a reason that they had that on their mind. Yeah, I don't think the Turkish government is too favorable towards people's freedoms, but yeah, Erdogan. I don't, I don't know. I know that we had some stuff go down there recently, but it was kind of, you know, uh, crazy as far as like we tried to throw overthrow them or something. It didn't work out. I don't know. They're definitely fighting with uh, Cyprus right now for some oil resources uh, that are sitting out in that Gulf. He's definitely been one of those just kind of like dictator rulers for a long time. Like, uh, I mean, everybody, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's like always like, uh, you know, he's an elected president, but I don't know. I think he's had control for quite some time. Seems pretty dictatorial with this move as far as like at war with Bitcoin. I mean, that's at war with your entire younger generation and anybody that's trying to, you know, stand on their own leg. The real funny thing is like him being against Bitcoin is a hysterical oxymoron when you really look at Islamic teachings around money. Like Bitcoin is even more in line with that school of thought than gold. And so it's like given that he is effectively trying to push Turkey more in a uh islamic like theocratic direction it's kind of hysterical to me that he's so anti-bitcoin yeah we need to get uh all the proper muslim speaking you know people of the world that know bitcoin in the right places like uh Janey and zaya and uh others i know mm -hmm. i mean dude i'm down with anybody who smashes the table of the money changers at the temple yeah, me too. That's where I changed my banner profile for that, man. Wreck those money changers. All right, so we've seen uh, different countries taking different regulatory positions to market themselves to Bitcoin community in various ways. And like Erdogan just saying, he's out flat out at war with Bitcoin. Well, Hungary is off to a good start with the Bitcoin community by releasing a statue of the famous inventor Satoshi Nakamoto. It's gotten a lot of praise online, and I like it too. I mean, it's a, it's an anonymous face mask that is shiny gold to reflect everyone's image into the face. So we all are all Satoshi, right? I love it. And uh, the face is wearing a traditional hacker gear, a hoodie with a Bitcoin B on the front. And, you know, as an artist, I really appreciate this rendition of Satoshi. I mean, what do you guys think? I don't know. I think at a cultural level, it's just interesting because it, this is the second like statue of Satoshi put up like this. And if I remember, I, I actually think my memory is very faulty on this topic. It was Ukraine that did the last one. But it, it, it's just really kind of interesting to me how that part of the world that was so deeply affected by like communism is just culturally like doing things like this, like elevating the cultural importance of Satoshi to this level openly and widely. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, people understand the dangers of communism and they understand market realities greater than a lot of people who have lived, you know, some comforting, you know, real padded lives with the fact that they've been in the favor of uh, the markets. Okay, quick Googling. Um, and yeah, it was Ukraine. I'm not sure if it actually um, happened, though. Like it was pretty much somebody wanted to take um, somewhere where a statue of Marx that got torn down stood and replace it with one of Satoshi. I don't yeah. think I've seen public statues of Satoshi, and not that I necessarily would have. Um, I too, I mean, we're we're pretty early in this, right? So you know, people are gonna make some statues of Satoshi at least for their gardens in the future. Um, but it's interesting to see public ones, and I like the statue personally. Uh, I think it'll probably age well. It'll it'll be interesting to a whole generation, I think. 
Right on. I think it's interesting. I like it. I mean, like, just the look of it and the design of it. And I know that's where, uh, you know, that's where um, Wasabi Wallet is, right? They're out of Hungary. The ZK Snacks or Snarks. Um, so, I mean, like, they've got Bitcoin companies there that are doing good stuff. And, yeah, I mean, they can recognize the power of this. And I think it will, you know, bring a little bit of Bitcoin tourism to the area. But I don't know. What do you think, Janine? Did you see it? I saw pictures. I did not see it in person. Yeah, it's pretty cool. All right. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. All right. Well, we'll just continue on, I guess. Uh, Got a good bit of stories here. And, you know, we can't go through our list of stories without hitting Conbase. Coinbase, you know, that ever-evolving shitcoin exchange has sent out a tweet letting the world know as of September 15th, quote, Today, Coinbase filed an application with the NFA to register as an FCM, Futures Commission Merchant. This is the next step, step to broaden our offerings and offer futures and derivatives tradings on our platform. Goal, further grow the crypto economy, close quote. So, Coinbase filed their compliance paperwork with the appropriate agency, the National Futures Association, the NFA, to offer their consumers futures products. No word as to which asset, but my guess would be Bitcoin and some shitcoin friends. But um, yeah, there's a little bit of, we got a rolling set of Conbay stories here. Let me let user take the next one. Or, you know, did you guys have any comment on this one first, I guess? Yeah, this, go ahead. Um, they have to if they don't want to get wrecked by the obviously coming um, shifts in the regulatory landscape. And FTX just bought LedgerX a few weeks ago, who already has a license to do these things. So if they want to stay relevant in the world of shitcoinery or just exchanges, then they need futures. Bingo. Futures and derivatives. Options are coming. Well, get out your accounts and start going full DGN. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, speaking of full DGEN and uh, Coinbase, uh, you know, Brian Armstrong was in a public Twitter feud with SEC the other day, calling them out for uh, not mm, giving him the meetings he wanted to discuss things like his lending products he wanted to roll out at Coinbase. And uh actually in that series of tweets proposed that you know maybe the right thing to do was just to roll it out anyway even though the sec had threatened to sue the firm if they launched it uh there's an update on that this week the firm has decided to not go ahead and roll out those lending products so uh we've got a full stop on that uh says here they were going to offer four percent interest on usdc that's got to be the lowest rate I've ever heard for the current state of this industry. That's like half of the better rates you can get. Uh, so I don't know. I'm going to mention conspiracy theory here. You know, who does this benefit? Uh, Cubono? Cubono? I, I don't know how to fucking speak Latin, but, you know, who's winning here? And I would have to propose it's the banks that win by keeping Coinbase out of this market. Yep. Wah, wah, wah. Brian Armstrong just gonna stay a compliance little kitty. Well, I mean, like this has come up a few times, I think, at this point on the show, and all the fucking time in the den. But like all of these lending platforms that perform interest, like yield on stable coins, they are competing with savings accounts in banks, and like. I have heard multiple stories at this point of people quite literally who do like nothing else in this space buying stable coins just to fucking lend them on platforms like that because it's more interest than a savings account. They don't like that. 
Yeah, I think the banks hate this. And we have corollary news with Texas asking Celsius for some documents related to their lending services. I believe New Jersey also asked Celsius similarly. Uh, there might have been some BlockFi news out of Texas too. But uh, these these companies are starting to look for their pound of flesh in uh, financialization products that are available in their states. Well, since you brought it up, might as well get into that one now, and then I'll swap out the uh, next one. Yeah, talking about the Celsius. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In other Celsius news, this this one's juicy and is not directly related to any of the state um, actions. Celsius uh, has evidently lost their prime trust account. So... What what is that to anybody what? who's wondering? So Prime Trust is a large financial intermediary that uh, some years ago set up an API that essentially allows you to run a quasi Bitcoin bank on them, which is to say they offer accounting services and custody services in Bitcoin. You buy access to their API for a monthly fee, and then you can offer to sub clients, uh, you know, access to those things, custody to prime trust. Uh, there are a number of crypto companies that run on top of these guys. Uh, one that comes to mind is Strike, uh, which came up recently. But these, uh, these prime trust guys are are evidently how Celsius uh, is doing accounting for their U.S. customers, and for oh, because of red flags in quotes, um, Prime Trust has pulled Celsius's uh, access in one month from do 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 from September seventeenth or so. So this is a really big deal. This is the way you shake up a company. Uh, so Celsius now needs the equivalent of prime trust, uh, both in terms of data API and uh, account hosting, but they also need somebody to custody, most likely, uh, for some of this. I don't know. They might do some of the custody stuff on their own. That's just me speculating. But this is a really big deplatforming right here. Yep. I mean, it's like, dude, this is, this is the system fighting back and people who don't appreciate on a deep level, the financial side of this space, like just might not get that. Like all of these lending platforms, all the fucking people who just ignore that side of the space if you're not holding your own keys it's a little black hole that they won't consider or won't think about these things despite not fitting into that category of bitcoin use and things i would never use myself they are a massive vehicle for attacking the financial system because these higher interest rates are literally a magnet to capital that will get a fraction of the yield in the legacy system without way higher risk than just simple lending, realizing they can get that yield somewhere else. And now all of these platforms are being attacked across the fucking board, all at the same time effectively in the grand scheme of things and the pace of how fast government works. Like that's something it doesn't matter how much the financial side of the space personally interests you or whether you care or not about benefiting it from financial or like benefiting from it financially, like wake up and look at what's going on. This is them fighting back. And it's not just some irrelevant lull, some custodial thing got wrecked. Like there are deeper dynamics and incentives going on here. Celsius definitely has some AUM, and I don't know that I've ever seen numbers on how that breaks down U.S. and extra U.S. I know they're all over the place, but the the concerns that are cited in this article are around rehypothecation of funds, and I don't know how they would be special versus a lot of these lending platforms, but uh, certainly something must have happened to offend because you know Prime Trust 
probably like selling these. I'm trying to remember, I looked up their price sheet uh, to have API access is something like 10 or 15 grand a month. It's it's a very, it's an expensive thing, yet that's cheap. That that means you don't have to run any of that Bitcoin infrastructure. So it's a it's very efficient for companies to use. Let's put it that way. Mm. It does seem like it's they're really pissed about people trying to park their funds somewhere other than a savings account or you know a bank. All right. Well, if no one else has any comments on this one, slide us along. I need a top off of Oktoberfest. Oh yeah. You gonna put some ice in that beer? <laughs> great, great segue. So yeah, the long and short is Conbase is working with the feds, but we knew that. We just didn't know on this scale with ice. Conbase is awarded contracts by various federal agencies to fulfill information requests. The most they were paid before was six hundred and ninety-five thousand dollars by the Justice Department and the FBI. But now a new agency is taking the lead in paying Conbase. That would be ICE, a.k.a. Homeland Security's Immigration Department. They are now paying Conbase a reported $1.365 million, $1,365,000 for, quote, business applications and application development software, close quote. Details are scarce on what the federal agency wants with Conbase other than to say, quote, This requirement is law enforcement sensitive, therefore minimal information will be provided publicly, close quote. Convase has shared its sensitive data through their Neutrino deal, deal, better known as Hacking Team, with the uh, Secret Service and the IRS. Now it looks like they have a new favorite customer with the Department of Homeland Security's Immigration Department. So not really much of a surprise, but it's pretty egregious. What do you guys think about this story? Well, I guess they bumped up their income by some like a factor of 10, right? Because the first time they announced anything like this, they were selling services for like a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars for a year long contract. And it's basically like the cost of an, a single engineer. So it's kind of a small thing here. Here we re- bumped it up, you know, about a factor of 10. They're slowly working it up. They'll probably be to 10 million by next year. Yeah, you know that customer data, it's uh, hard to sit your hands on. I mean, it really does seem like their business model is really just consume customer data, sell them, you know, whatever shit they want, they don't care, and then sell that data to government agencies. Dude, honestly, like my interpretation here, because this makes absolutely no financial sense whatsoever from like the potential reputational hit, like that is insignificant pennies compared to their trading fee revenue this is like probably some really dumb fuck naive way of trying to be like see government we're helping you with stuff let us do things we want to do there is that and that's i think that's kind of how big tech interacts with governments you got ass the government's got ass you know so they're in here filling ass and the good thing is you can make a lot of money while you do that game with the government yeah i mean they're rolling around in circles in washington and dc i mean i'm and silicon valley i'm sure they're talking about like you know hey how can we help you guys and you guys help us and you know we're trying to you know rub the right shoulders to make sure we get all our products delivered to the consumers we want so i mean doing this kind of thing is really it's not like a business decision as much as it's just like if you want to roll with these circles you've got to wash these hands too I wonder I wonder what the focus of ICE is for using their service. Like maybe when people are coming into the country, they want to maybe check their wallets and then trace where the money's coming from, something like that. Absolutely. That would be my guess. I mean, like if you're talking about people coming, I mean, there's not, there's right now a flood of immigrants coming across the border. I mean, there's video footage of all this and it's a pretty big crisis, but I'm sure there's some sort of, you know, money moving across the around that they would like to track and if they knew that people had coinbase accounts they would like to get access to those please let us do our lending program you can oppress the immigrants yep and the future technocracy or whatever government it is is rolling forward so directly Ooh. related in other corporate spying you know as a business model 
Wait, did we? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to sort this all out in my head because I just realized you all made a fucking clusterfuck of the news desk organization here. But yeah, you're up next to me. I'm sorry if I segued too early, but in competitor news. The MasterCard stuff, Jeannie. She's sleepy. All right, yeah. So um, on September 9th, it was announced that MasterCard will extend its capabilities deep into the field of digital assets with an agreement to acquire CypherTrace, a leading cryptocurrency intelligence company with insight into more than 900 cryptocurrencies. Uh, As digital assets, including cryptocurrencies and non-fungible tokens, NFTs, become more entwined with everyday activities, from the way people pay and get paid to how they invest, uh, trust and security will be critical enablers to ensure broad adoption and scale. Wow, this is just buzzword bingo all the time. These new technologies will require new solutions and more powerful intelligence to ensure that the crypto economy is instilled with the same trust and peace of mind that consumers currently experience with more traditional payment methods. Wow, that's basically saying like, hey, surveillance, good, um, in very many words. Um, the integrated offering will build on CypherTrace's suite of digital assets and MasterCard cybersecurity solutions to provide businesses with greater transparency to help identify and understand their risks and to help manage their digital asset regulatory and compliance obligations. Of course, it's all about the compliance. That's really it. Um, further, the deal enables MasterCard to combine the technology, AI, and cyber capabilities. <laughs> of both companies to differentiate its card and real-time payments infrastructure, allowing customers and stakeholders globally to build upon and benefit from the solutions to protect their consumers and comply with regulations as they build their own virtual asset offerings. Terms of the agreement were not disclosed and the transaction is anticipated to close before the end of the year pending certain conditions. Yeah, so basically this is a long, really drawn out way of saying MasterCard wants to surveil, cryptocurrencies probably wants to track when people use MasterCard infrastructure to buy or sell cryptocurrencies and wants to be able to follow that shit. Um, It's that simple. It's not that exciting. It's actually very bad. Um, Yeah. So, no, not good news. This is a natural alliance of the great Satans. Here's a really simple piece of advice I can give. If you use MasterCard to buy Bitcoin through any platforms, um, build up your buys, and then withdraw them in totally randomized amounts versus the fiat purchases you made in MasterCard. So let's say you make three different purchases of $50, pull out 30 and then 70 and then the rest or something like that so that you completely break the value correlation between shit flowing in from MasterCard and flowing out on the blockchain. Just to underscore the impact of this, you know, this is about the future too. Uh, Visa and MasterCard would love to clear stable coins. If if we get to this future where there's some stable coins that are approved of by, you know, the Fed and the banking system, maybe they even come from the banking system and you're walking around spending those on your lunch and whatever else, uh, you know, MasterCard and Visa would love to be the rails for businesses clearing those things. So this this is all about watching forever across the popular ways that merchants are going to interact with this network. Yeah, just stay away from MasterCard for sure. Want to ble- want to be a slave? Use MasterCard. The card of your master. <laughs> Have you seen their carbon calculator? Oh, no. yeah. Actually, let's just throw that in here if you want to get into it, Rick. I'll throw the citation yeah, I, up later. I just posted it in the mumble. So, yeah, MasterCard is issuing carbon credit scores through a carbon calculator that's going to watch your payments uh, through MasterCard. Huh. What? Give what, it. What? Give it. The, the carbon score of how how much carbon did you consume, pal? Holy Can we all shit. guess where this is going? Can we guess, hey, huh? Hey, they don't even have to buy cipher trace to sell this to the government as an input to your future credit score. Ding 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 ding. Oh, well, so well, business. You mean well, your social credit score? All of the scores. 
Yeah, I don't I don't even I don't have a credit score. <laughs> oh, but you do, Janine. I'm sure. They're sure. MasterCard would like to give you one. I bet they would. How much do you care about the environment? But but this I mean it's all kind of pointless. It's kind of like how what wasn't uh wasn't the carbon footprint invented I heard recently the carbon footprint idea like personal carbon footprint was invented by British Petroleum to shift responsibility for environmental damage onto individual consumers and not giant corporations who and the US military who does the most damage out of literally everyone. Um, so is this sort of like that where the banking system is saying, hey, here's your personal carbon footprint yep. for your purchases, even though yep. our frickin' infrastructure is responsible for all of the damage, yep. <laughs> you know, because not, it's not so inefficient. Mention, not, not to mention, you can't actually accurately score that without complete omniscient view of the entire supply chain and knowing which physical sources from and through what parts of a supply chain that product the specific thing you buy actually went through because yeah that's literally yeah. no good is fungible in that sense so yeah the whole thing's a fucking joke it's interesting we never talk about pollution anymore it's all this abstract uh -huh. carbon plant food stuff yep Yep. Just eat your bugs. It's it's not how much diesel did you just burn to bring your crap over from China, or what fucking bled into the water table somewhere, or leaked into the ocean, or gets thrown out in the fucking trash and then disposed of improperly. Mm -hmm. Like things that we can actually take rational action about. Whole narrative completely shifted away from that, and it's kind of funny. Because if you really look back at the roots of environmentalism, what was it almost solely focused on? Pollution. Pollution and killing species off. And we still have both those issues. But my gas spits carbon out in the air when it burns in my car. Therefore, you will have a score. Everybody's going to have a score. I mean... that. It's crazy, but that's where I was saying, just stay away from MasterCard because it looks like they're on the wrong side of history going down this road of craziness where, and you know, there's a lot of this in the, uh, you know, in the potential new infrastructure bill coming out and all, all that. And we'll see, we'll get to if it comes out like, uh, like it's supposed to, but it's a world of crazy. Did you know that Bitcoin, every Bitcoin transaction burns two iPhones? Did you know? <laughs> Every time you think about Bitcoin, it's like aborting a fetus. <laughs> okay, that went a bit far. <laughs> That's off. Excuse me. Lots of energy destruction if you're using Bitcoin. So we're all going to be terrorists in not too long. That, Fud, that one actually isn't accurate because I mean it's mostly it's mostly left leaning people saying that stuff and they don't care about that so that's not a good example to use. <laughs> hey, Janine, this is clown what? world now. Anything can happen. <laughs> oh god. Yeah, uh, yeah. Should, should, I, should, let, let, let's move on. Let's move on. Yeah, sorry, bring us to left field, but I had to bring that up. And uh, well, that's yeah, a let's good thing you did. Like, it, we, I think these days, just because we're all busy and, like, scheduling is an issue, like, there's probably a lot of things we should talk about on here. We don't, just because we're trying to minimize how much time we have to spend on shit. That was one of them. True. Necessary discussion. And I'm sure it'll be back in the rounds later. So, yeah, let's get back to what's going on in the world of, you know, financial market stuff or you know etfs what what is this yeah so apparently on september 8th um the president of fidelity digital assets um had a private video call with some sec officials um in which they were kind of twisting their arm a bit asking for approval of physical bitcoin futures which is not the same thing as 
an ETF based on, you know, cash settled futures contracts, which is what the regulatory landscape has kind of been looking towards approving. And so, yeah, this is really interesting to kind of have Fidelity specifically make that ask when things seem to be moving towards consensus on a cash settled um, futures based ETF. And like, yeah, um, ETFs have kind of just been something that made me laugh after the first couple ones uh, years and years ago, every time they come up. Um, this is a really different situation when you have some player like Fidelity with a, a probably likely concession in terms of futures-based products coming in the future to sit down and go, no, we want physical settlement. So yeah, uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I think this is kind of an atmosphere change in regards to the possibility of ETFs. So this sounded like a fair bit of pushback uh, to the SEC, and I'm going to do my per episode like Castle Island podcast quoting, uh, but they talked about this and they talked about why this is public. So there's some kind of form somewhere along the way of the ETF process. You sign with the SEC and it basically says everything after this is now public. So any meetings you have, whatever PowerPoints come up, what we talk about is all public. So Fidelity had already signed this form, and that's why we even get access to this information here. So Fidelity, according to Castle Island, and I didn't read this directly, went in there with the SEC and they said, look, uh, we have some statistical studies here, which was evidently based on CoinMetrics data, that said, hey, it looks like spot prices are set off of futures prices over at the CME. And if spot prices really do correlate and are ultimately set by futures prices, then there's no reason we shouldn't be able to run off of spot prices for our ETF because essentially we are already running off of futures prices. Here is our data. And it, it's very interesting that they went to the trouble of figuring that out kind of shows how clued in to the market they must be and how good at trading they probably are over there. Uh, but past that, they showed this to the SEC. So the SEC is at least aware that somebody is out there doing this math. Well, it's good to hear that there's finally an atmosphere where futures physically delivered ETF for Bitcoin might be possible. Because, man, we've been talking about this for Years and years. I mean, it feels like I'm trying to count the years or for sure. It's going to be the yep. most subscribed thing ever whenever it finally comes about. Moon. But who knows? Yeah, maybe it's a big nothing burger. Maybe Rico's right. I like nothing burgers. Send all the dollars to Canada. <laughs> I mean, at this point, guys, like the dynamic set up here with all of these derivative plays like companies like MicroStrategy effectively becoming a backdoor ETF, like all of the jump in publicly traded like mining companies, like people are just saying fuck it and hacking in any indirect exposure that they can. And at the same time you have Fidelity, like just my read to just be blunt is kind of going like what the fuck? Like we could be making the fucking fees off of that volume. Get your fucking shit together. Like, the whole landscape is wildly different than back in 2016 with the first Winklevi decision. Wildly different. Yeah, and this is Fidelity, which is one of the largest uh, retirement account holders and administrators in the United States. Mm -hmm. They have some like seven trillion. They've, they've got a ton of trillions under management over there. And what they see is another option on the checklist of what do you want to do with your money in the 401k? And they either see that every option could have some cryptocurrency allocation, or you could even have a specific one that's like, bang it, hit, hit the cryptos. We're going to sell it. Yeah. Like the, sorry, I was just going to say that like, uh, 
at the same time, you know, there is a lot more talk from the SEC about regulating some of these token infrastructures as securities. And in fact, today, somebody's tweeting out about this, uh, wherever this mainnet 2021 is, uh, somebody's getting handed some SEC paperwork at the before they go on the stage. But we don't know if this is true. This is just a tweet from a few hours ago. Fantastic diligence. So I would just like to gripe live. Uh, no, wait, never mind. Never mind. Just going to yell at Rodolfo for a block clock bug, but it worked. <laughs> We're always verifying the work. Alrighty. So we ready for these next two? Yeah, some new block stream stuff. All right. So fucking... Finally, finally, there is single signature support in Blockstream Green. Like, finally, you can download this wallet and just get a single key set up that does not do the two of two where they are a cosigner on things, where you don't have to deal with the you know, pre-signed transactions or recently the CSV clause to get your money back and wait through a time lock. You can you can now use Blockstream Green with just a single SIG address where you're the only signer, finally. And they are promising soon features, which I hope given their, their latest raise, um, have, have a little more energy behind them. Um, the ability to connect to your own Electrum server, um, single SIG wallets for Liquid, because this feature is only live for mainnet Bitcoin right now, and um, hardware wallet support for single SIG for all of the different hardware wallets, which it looks like right now um, is not supported. Like you can only use single SIG with uh, a key hosted on the actual uh, app on Android or iOS or desktop or whatever and native tour support so let, let's see how fast the progress on the rest of those things comes but holy fucking shit finally because i have never really wanted to recommend that wallet widely because of the inability to opt out of the security model that they originally built it on where they're effectively like a 2fa to stop your coins from getting stolen and now I finally can. Nice. By the way, I said I said recommend. I did not say show for money. Roger that. Of course. I'm, I'm, I'll be able to make history, guys. I'll be able to, you know, recommend something Blockstream did without getting paid for it. it, it it'll be a historical first. We all know you get your kickback, dude. <laughs> I bet you pay them to be allowed to recommend things. <laughs> okay. You, he had you, to buy his hoodie. You just Can you believe that? They made him pay game. for the hoodie. Fifty dollars. <laughs> the secret <laughs> block stream spy hoodie. But yeah. Uh next up on Blockstream's front, uh a little little old news at this point because we uh paying chill. We uh, disappeared for a week. Got to uh, cover it. They are partnering with the uh, Macquarie um, Investment Bank in Australia, which has $400 billion of assets under management um, to build a new mining facility. And specifically, you know, um, along the same vein of their involvement with Acker from uh, Norwegia um, with Square in the U.S. Um, specifically look at carbon neutral energy sources for their mining operation. And, um, you know, this is, uh, yeah, the, the whole difference in dynamic, I think, if you want to accumulate Bitcoin between retail and massive pools of capital is market slippage i could probably go buy a whole bitcoin right now and maybe only have two separate orders getting filled 
um, and the difference between those two orders in terms of slippage, because it's just forty three grand. Um, somebody who wants to dump ten billion dollars into Bitcoin, yeah, that's going to have to break up into way more orders to get filled in a market book and suffer way more slippage. But if you take a longer term view and you want to start mining, that slippage can be a lot smoother in terms of like just actually accumulating that Bitcoin. I think Blockstream is killing it right now in setting themselves up to be the guys who can go around and help make that happen for big pools of capital. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, th this is going to get really interesting over the next decade to see who else Blockstream starts working with and how widely the mining side of their services really start getting demand. Definitely a well-rounded Bitcoin company, well-positioned. Yep, and these guys are not in it for one or two-year returns. When you build out something like this, you're looking at stuff like decade time horizon. So it'll be interesting to see them get their taste of what investing in Bitcoin is like. Uh, others watch and see what happens. Yeah, it really is awesome to watch them. I mean, like, come on, the Blockstream satellite still just kind of blows my mind. Just to get that some more of those up in the air. So, I think you have some BTC Pay related news, and also I'm very suspicious right now about why Rick just disconnected and then Fud disconnected. Is the most side fucking with this recording? No, I was having server. I was having connection issues because I'm not at home, you know, but. Yeah, users probably also got some connection issues. You can't well, keep us down, Mossad. <laughs> <laughs> well, a uh, BTC Pay server announced that they have received another 100K grant from Square Crypto. They've received 100K grants from Square for three years in a row now, always announced in September. And in their tweet, they say, just as the previous two, we will drink it and print useless business cards. <laughs> how great yeah btc pay server is a uh, great project it's good to see that they get steady donations and you know just goes to show that if you're doing good work in this ecosystem you don't really have too much problem with funding but i can understand it's still a grind for those out there yeah, I mean, to be clear, they're definitely not sitting around printing useless business cards. They're building a useful tool that many people and businesses use to sell things for Bitcoin. And it works. It has a lot of great documentation. Yep. As a user of BTC Pay, um, I really love seeing all this constant funding, especially from companies like Square, whose main business model is quite literally a merchant payment processor. Like, <sighs> I'm not fond of Jack and how Twitter has gone in that regard. But it's getting harder and harder for me to find rational reasons to be skeptical of how they are stepping into the Bitcoin space. We'll see how their hardware wallet develops. I'm going to keep trying, though. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, move into another company that's making moves. Um, Paxos made a deal with Interactive Broker. So uh, Paxos is making moves to bring more people in the traditional markets access to crypto products, mainly... Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, and <laughs> Bitcoin Cash. Uh, the deal comes through NASDAQ-listed online brokerage firm Interactive Brokers, Brokers and Paxos Trust. Um, Paxos, back in April of this year, was granted a provisional trust charter through the U.S. Office of Currency Comptroller, or the OCC. This was granted because they have an approved business plan with the OCC, and they have a year and a half to implement that plan. They've been moving swiftly, swiftly working with MasterCard to handle payments in stablecoins. 
Today, they announced a deal with a clearinghouse that handles 20 million trades a day. And now they'll also be working with uh, this online brokerage firm, Interactive Brokers, to sell Bitcoin and other digital assets to the traditional markets. Milan Galik, chief executive officer of Interactive Brokers, said, quote, as financial markets evolve, sophisticated individuals and institution institutional investors are increasingly seeking out allocations to digital currencies as a mean of achieving their fi financial objectives. In giving our clients access to cryptocurrency trading, we recognize the need to meet the growing investor demand to trade cryptocurrencies along other asset classes in a convenient and low-cost way, close quote. And Paxos is said to only charge a commission of 0.12 to 0.18% of trade value depending on monthly volume, where their competitors can charge up to 2%. So that's the news. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Up, down, or sideways for Bitcoin, I'm sure. It's uh, it's good. What do you guys think? Well, more institutional money. Oh, FUD's alive now. Ha. Oh, thank the Lord. That was fun. My whole VPN just decided to go away, I think. The Mossad's <laughs> after us. They are. It's getting real, boys and girls. All right. Well, you made it back just in time to hear that there's more traditional money coming into the system. Uh, Paxos tr partnering with investors, brokers, and investors, brokers. So that story, that's that's great. It's natural. You know, interactive brokers has always been kind of the progressive place to buy your stocks, if you will. They've had access to a lot of markets that you can't necessarily get elsewhere for people who want to invest internationally and that sort of thing. Uh, so they've been well regarded for a long time. I thought it was fun because their CEO came out and said he had been holding Bitcoin for something like three years. Uh, along with this news. So uh, it's just one of those things. The traditional guys, and especially the front runners, see us. Yeah, that's right. I think he was the one who was tweeting out about Bitcoin was something, you know, he was putting out some FUD, but at the meanwhile, really, he was just buying the dip. That's going on all <laughs> over the place. All day long. You ready for some less legacy financial news? Yeah. So, Paxful, who has been absolutely slaying it in the developing market after local Bitcoins um, went to shit, uh, have now integrated the Lightning Network. And this is extremely fucking awesome because it's just a cold hard reality in any type of high fee environment the idea of self custodying your own coins in that part of the world can get very stupidly expensive and so having the option to withdraw over lightning is a massive game changer even with lightning's own scaling limitations and the potential problems in getting receiving liquidity because as Galois has proven in El Zante, you can just build little micro banks ran by people in your community that you trust and you can withdraw your money there. So that in that type of high fee spike environment in you know the situation of that maturing and becoming a constant thing eventually, even if people can't afford to take complete unilateral or unilateral control of their coins, they can move it from a platform that is completely impersonal and not socially scalable as a point of trust and move it somewhere much more local and socially scalable in terms of like, can or can you not trust the person operating this? So just like what Paxful is as a major market platform for that part of the world, integrating with Lightning opens so much fucking potential. It's stupid. Like this is fucking awesome. And I already know that Ray, the CEO, is thinking in terms of how do we actually handle people integrating to Lightning on their, uh, their own side. 
so that that whole issue can kind of be solved comprehensively. So I think there are lots of exciting things coming in the future for this. Awesome. Yeah, because, I mean, Bray and what they're doing in, uh, you know, Nigeria and that whole area just uh, seems like some amazing work. And, you know, to see them have this kind of integration go and maybe try to move it at full steam where people are spinning up their own nodes, like, that's awesome. All right, are we we ready for some funny stuff, though, that shows just how silly early on um, lightning adoption is? Yeah, man, we got a whole country on it. It's early on. It is. And this next story is going to show. Um, so, to be a little bit of a dick, I just want to preface this as like this was one of the most obvious attacks in the world to the, to the fact that this is something I've seen discuss, I've discussed for years at this point to take advantage of anybody offering services on Lightning. And it's pretty much somehow get your routing node in, like have a wallet to receive and then a completely separate routing node and somehow get that in the middle between your receiving wallet and some service you're withdrawing over Lightning to. And just play around and see what the maximum fee for your own withdrawal you can charge with your routing node and just scrape extra sats off of that. Um, And the big problem was always like, well, how could you guarantee that your routing node is what's in the easy? You set up your routing node and then the receiving wallet open a channel to just your routing node so that literally the only connection between that receiving wallet and the rest of the lightning network is your own or own routing node and then you you just deposit get the receiving liquidity set up uh through the exchange and just start withdrawing shit and just find the maximum fee that that routing node can charge for your withdrawal to yourself in the middle there um and as long as that is more than the withdrawal fee from that service, you're just pocketing free sats. And somebody actually did this and attacked Bitfinex, OKX, Moon Wallet, Wallet of Satoshi, LN Markets, and SouthX Exchange, which I've never heard of. Um, and yeah, this boils down to effectively all of these services not having proper settings in terms of maximum fees paid or paying attention to like how much is being paid in fees on their end to process withdrawals. And obviously, if you don't charge withdrawal fees, then this gets even easier to pull and pockets more money for the attacker. Um And so before anyone gets any funny ideas of going and trying this, um, this was disclosed and patched already by all the affected businesses. But yeah, Lightning is still so early when you have actual bit like Bitfinex, OKX did not have their shit properly configured to deal with this. And this is something that autists on the internet have been discussing for a few years in terms of theoretical attacks you can pull on the lightning network. So yeah, um, there's a long way to go here. Sats back at you. Well, it's good to see that the attack is being discussed and, you know, like it was patched properly. And I mean, it is, it does go to show that we're early on, but it does just also go to show that we've, we come a long way down the road. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, I mean, the, the point I'm trying to make, though, is like there is a massive disconnect between the theoretical body of knowledge around the protocol that is just kind of like, duh, to somebody like me versus what engineers actually implementing and integrating this into services have. And this just shows it like this is like, you know, I'm 
to be a little bit fucking condescending and a dick here. This is day one stuff, dude. And like, look at some of the services that had not properly considered this and implemented protections for it. Like, there's a long way to go in terms of actual adoption and use of lightning versus the theory of it. Yeah, there's a big step between making something work in a proof of concept sense and making something worth correctly and financially correctly for your government or for your your business along the way right so i wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people got in and said you know what we really want to get this integration in it's going to be a great pr thing if we do that we're we're talking about trivial fees here let's not worry about the the mathematics of this yet let's ship product mm -hmm. i want to extend casos joke of lolly 2.0 and say that someone should have made this into a service called lolly gag <laughs> oh gosh yeah the lightning network still got ways to go it's uh you know it's not as i mean it's still reckless a little bit it's, it's not as hashtag reckless but you know like you've been harping on for a long time there needs to be better standards and everything coming in and a lot of people are just, you know, going with it because it's good efficiency gains and it's good marketing, but it's like, you know, it's not really optimized unless you're actually working with an engineer and doing the channel work that is necessary. Yep. So I guess um, on to you, Janine. Um, I did not have a chance to see what this was actually. Uh, so there was an article published in the Wall Street Journal on September 6th titled, A Generation of American Men Give Up on College. I Just Feel Lost. The number of men enrolled at two- and four-year colleges has fallen behind women by record levels and a widening education gap across the U.S. And it was quite interesting because it was talking about like how there's a lot of men in college who are struggling and they can't get any help because no one wants to help the white men <laughs> um, is, is kind of like, yeah, you, you think that's maybe a problem to discriminate uh, based on gender and race. Um, maybe you shouldn't do that. Um, but so while the title kind of implies an overall sad story, at least uh, a few of the people interviewed did not seem too upset about skipping out on the great American college experience. Uh, for example, Daniel Brills, 18 years old, graduated in June from Hastings High School in Hastings, Minnesota, he decided against college during his senior year despite earning a 3.5 grade point average and winning a $2,500 college scholarship from a local vet veterans organization. Okay, I just want to point out, $2,500 gets you absolutely nowhere in the U.S. in terms of college, but let's continue. He took a landscaping job and takes home about $500 a week. Mr. Brills, a musician, also earns some income from creating and selling music through streaming services, he said, and invests in cryptocurrencies. His parents both attended college, and they hope he, too, will eventually apply. So far, they haven't pressured him, he said. If I was going to be a doctor or a lawyer, they, then obviously those people need a formal education, but there are definitely ways to get around it now, Mr. Bill said. There are opportunities that weren't taught in school that could be a lot more promising than getting a degree. Um, and uh, not to say that I recommend generally investing in cryptocurrencies, <clears throat> Bitcoin only, um, but being such a college skipper myself, who is much better off from not having gone to college, um, not entirely by choice either, I can say that it's not the worst decision in the world. Uh, I can honestly say that not going to university, um, like most people were doing around me, that decision uh, was probably the best decision I ever made. So yes, I, uh, I agree with this person uh, too, <laughs> I guess probably I mean, he's probably going to have more in savings than he would have spent and gotten into debt with going to university. Yep. I mean, it's for sure a bad direction to go into the United States universities or American university system right now. It's, I mean, like, there's just so much opportunity to learn information off the internet. And I mean, it's really just not a good time. I would probably just opt for some sort of engineering or craft job, skilled trade job, 
because that's going to get you a lot more further in the long run as far as value uh, for your time. But there are some benefits to going to college. I went to college for about 60 hours, and I remember I got, you know, throughout all the crap, there was like this really good history professor that taught me a really solid herstory you know she was a really good history teacher but it was she was always like jokes around about how it was her story not his story and she was a great history teacher and you know learned a lot in that class so you can learn things in school but ultimately like there's a lot of bad going on right now in universities yeah as the the minority white male college grad here I would say, you know what, there is a lot of value out there for you on the internet. And if you're a young person trying to decide what to do right now, I think if you follow your interests and you look at where you can offer value to other people based on what does interest you about things, you can probably go a long ways with that right now. And I would encourage you to just keep going down rabbit holes. You're, you're going to feel like you're digging forever to learn something significant, but that is what happens when you're actually well-trained at college. That's what happens when you learn anything well. It takes a long time. You end up with a lot of detail of knowledge, and uh, hopefully that's helpful for you in your future and essentially selling your time to people. Pro tip, if you want to get... Um expensive books for free uh create a recycling club at your school because apparently schools and teachers have a habit of getting rid of their textbooks through just throwing them out or putting them in the recycling bin <laughs> so get free free hardcover textbooks that way yeah and plug that into textbook resales and pretty soon you're making lightning fees off every transaction you know what i'm saying it's a business model there Start mining Bitcoin from your uh, your campus dorm. You, you know what they also put in the recycling bin? Um, uh, directories for university staff. <laughs> but yeah. Um, I know where you all live. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not saying much because uh, all of my friends are people who went into stupid fields of study but i don't have a single friend who actually finished college that is not massively in debt and grinding their face off to pay it off with no actual investments or savings outside of the few with 401ks and shit and um yeah i have no debt and more money in the bank than half of them and even with you know some of the scientific or engineering based degrees out there you can do you can learn most of that shit yourself and it might be a little harder in some fields to find a job. Um, it's not going to be that much harder. So yeah. Do you want to be a, a, a debt slave to somebody? Well, I guess if that's your kink, keep hacking step by step by step, you'll build something. Yeah. Is and I, is Definitely. there a kink, is there a kink website for debt slaves? Dude, there's a kink for fucking everything. Like there are dudes who have fucking like chicks tie them up and just spend oh, their God. money on their credit card because they find that exciting for some deranged reason. That's actually a thing. You credit cards? Yeah, just work it out. You'll find the extra added effort to make it on your own and figure it out will get you a long way too as far as like learning more through the experience than just out of books or classrooms all right what is it with the cold card rodolfo is a fucking dick and he's teasing us about the mark fort ah uh, so yeah he, he just posted a quick video um demonstrating but it looks like the next version of the cold card is going to have nfc support which um versus the sd card um and sd protocol as far as the current method um it, it does potentially have some implications in terms of security it's a different stack um in terms of the implementations, the actual protocol. Um, so if you want to be completely autistic about things, consider that. But it is a huge game changer in usability because 
I have no problem popping an SD card into my laptop or desktop to, to manage things, but what if I only have a smartphone? Kind of presents obnoxious problems. But with native NFC support on the cold card, um, now it doesn't. So little subtle security changes there to consider on the autistic level of the spectrum. But yeah, if the Mark IV ships with NFC, that is a huge game changer for people out there who don't have a computing device other than a smartphone. Yeah, nice mm-hmm. thought. I didn't really think about that where, you know, yeah, you don't have an SD card in every scenario. So it's nice to have that. And it's cool that Rodolfo is working on this. And yep, cold card. Seems like it was a smart move. Well, I mean, even like, even though, like, because I'm, I'm going to be autistic now. Like, uh, a lot of smartphones do have SD card support, but it's like, that's a pain in the ass to deal with on a physical level. And two, what name a Bitcoin smartphone wallet that can run on a, a phone with an SD card slot that actually supports moving transactions back and forth through that? Because I can't think of one. Block streams green. Hot take. That's actually a cold card Mark V. And he's gaslighting us to buy Mark IVs. <laughs> <laughs> Sneaky bastard. I bet we'll see a fucking new version of the Open Dime that I'll piss away money on for that, too. But, yeah. Guess that's a wrap for the day, and we are into final thoughts. Well, don't all think at once. There was an article last week um, about a experiment that was done in December where... Uh, a photographer trans, uh, he put, um, four and a half gigabytes of photos on a DVD. And then on the other hand, he tried to transfer the same four and a half gigabytes over the internet about 10 to someone about 10 kilometers away. And, um, the DVD was delivered by horseback and they were trying to see which one would finish first and the horse won. <laughs> Oh, so God. yeah, someone please start a um a Pony Express. I will be your first uh employee. Come on guys, do thinking the Oktoberfest is kicking in. No, I posted my final thought. It's uh this guy's uh tweet. I thought it was funny. It was worthy of just mentioning BTC underscore archive on Twitter's Bitcoin is digital real estate. Ethereum is Chinese real estate. (laughs) Kind of highlights what's going on right now as far as uh, that ever grand real estate blowout in China, as well as, like we were saying earlier, the SEC kind of taking new positions with infrastructure that's always kind of been dubiously security-like. I should also mention that our favorite mobile shitcoin uh, is appearing in Signal apps outside of the UK. They were initially beta testing it in the UK, and it looks like they've expanded it because now people outside the UK are seeing it in Signal. So, woo! Um, also, just a reminder, if you're an American, um, you're not allowed to touch any of this shit. Um of course, you can easily get around that by just not having a U.S. phone number and not being in the U.S. And then they apparently will um, <laughs> still upgrade your app with it anyway. I'm opening my Signal app right now. I mean, if you see it, that would be hilarious because that means they've, like, fucked up. <laughs> yeah, I imagine I won't get it i'm still just seeing a regular message interface nothing new about any kind of token infrastructure well i know the messaging over the last week or maybe maybe a little longer has been be afraid be very afraid but honestly i i'm getting good vibes out of this i'm i'm getting like the 
they've shot about all the arrows they can shoot this month kind of vibes out of this so you know might might be a good time to pick up commodities what kind of commodities bitcoin all right i'm 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 I'm, I'm gonna just call it so really 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 weird thing um happened while we were recording isn't that usually the case yep but this one is really weird oh Um, god so there's an account cosimo de medici who has been kind of a an nft show and uh yes snoop dog just tweeted out that he is cosimo medici and then changed his avatar to an nft um, oh so yeah buckle okay. up buttercups shit's gonna get weird so wait snoop dogg's now an nft um snoop dogg's <laughs> been um supposedly anonymously operating a massive um nft account for a while now <laughs> and he just came out oh, man. Oh, already of course snoop dogg is operating the nft exchange dispensary whatever they are it's gonna be nope dog very soon whoa I mean... Let's let's cite another tweet. Robinhood trials crypto wallet and cryptocurrency transfer features. What? Eh. Boys Will they girls be coin based to death? Hmm. That just that liberates Satoshi's. Free the Satoshi's. Dude, there needs to be a meme of like, you know, two people beating somebody with a bat and it's just FTX and Robin Hood and Coinbase. <laughs> Coinbase is obviously on the ground getting beaten with bats. Time for bed. Alrighty. On that violent note, adios punks. Hope you enjoyed. Bye. Later everyone. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> <laughs>